Well, welcome, welcome. Hope everybody's having a good week. Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. It gives us each the opportunity to make sure they're in fellowship with God and ready for the teaching of his word. Let's pray. Father, once again, we do thank you for the privilege and opportunity that we have to be able to come together and study your word. We pray that you'll be with us this evening as we continue our study in the book of 2 Timothy. Help us with our understanding and application that we may use it to, to continue our growth in the knowledge and in the grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, we are in the book of 2 Timothy, in chapter uh, 1, verse 8, uh, and we're going to finish this chapter up, I think, this evening. And it says, therefore, talking to Timothy, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner. Now, Paul had just got through encouraging Timothy, and this is his opening statement, basically, chapter 1 to introduce this letter to Timothy, to encourage him to stay strong in his faith and stay strong in teaching accurate doctrine. He says, uh, just before verse eight here, he says, for this reason, I remind you to rekindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you, which was of course the gift of pastor teacher. And he says, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and love and self-discipline. So Paul says, therefore, because of that, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. So Paul is giving encouragement to Timothy, and he tells him not to be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus Christ. That word testimony means to testify or to give evidence as, uh, as in a trial. So Paul was encouraging Timothy to continue to be that witness for Jesus Christ by unashamedly teaching accurate Bible doctrine, which is giving evidence, which has been taught to him by, which had been taught to him by Paul. Remember that uh, there was a group in Ephesus where Timothy was the pastor when Paul wrote this to him that had uh, kind of come up against uh, Timothy and he, uh, they were, uh, causing all kind of issues for Timothy as a young pastor. And so Paul is encouraging him not to be afraid of these people. Stay with accurate doctrine and don't be ashamed to teach the accuracy of, of doctrine. Don't let these people who have fallen for false doctrine, follow the Judaizers, for example, don't let them lead you astray, Timothy. You stay with what you were taught by me, which is in accordance with God and his word. So the gospel, according to the power of God, uh, is the power that brings salvation to those who believe in Christ. And by staying true to the truth of God's word, Christians are going to suffer. It is part of our spiritual lives. This suffering will come in from Satan's world system in the forms of people testing, system testing, disaster testing, or thought testing. Remember, guys, we're in a battle. We're in a spiritual battle, and we are going to suffer. Satan is going 
to do all he can to keep you and, and me off track spiritually. He does not want us to succeed in our spiritual life. It's just another way that he can point out some of the failures of Christians and say, see, Lord, you know, these people, they're, they're not worthy. But the reason we are worthy is because of the power of God that gave us salvation the moment we believed in Christ. The opportunity, apparently, that Satan had and rejected. So the Apostle Paul had already suffered a great deal of Satan's evil. He, he suffered a great deal of evil for the name of Christ and the gospel. And he was encouraging Timothy to follow his example of never compromising the gospel or accurate Bible doctrine. And more than any other believer uh, in his time, Paul was attacked directly by Satan. Remember, he says that, that the Satan buffeted him, he uses that word buffeted him. Uh, and Satan did it and used his evil system uh, that he, uh, he has in order to uh, bring suffering into the life of Paul. So when Paul talks about suffering for the gospel, according to the power of God, he's thinking back to those times when he was stoned, they tried to kill him, when he was abused, when he was uh, in prison, when they, they said that he was uh, in the ministry only for uh, his own personal gain and wealth. Uh, all these types of suffering came into Paul's life, whether they were mental or whether they were physical. So Paul knew very well that if you stay with accurate Bible doctrine, there is going to be suffering in this life as a, as a Christian. And he says, who had, he, he says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. And so this, may, this verse here is to make us realize that God's purpose was not only to save us by his grace, but he wants to, us to live by his grace. Grace means the absence of all human work or human effort. And grace means God does all the work and we simply allow him to do it in and through us. And not only are we to live by grace and not under some system of legalism or ritualism or tabooism, but we are to grow in grace. And that means growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we study God's word and we learn it and we apply it and we grow spiritually uh, and we do it God's way under the system of grace, then we bring glory and honor to him. Those Christians who think that they have to do something uh, in order to gain God's approval and his um uh, his blessing, if you will, uh, are wrong. He does it. He does it through us. What brings honor and glory to God is when we stay in fellowship with him and we apply his word on a consistent basis and we live our spiritual lives and we represent Jesus Christ here on this earth and bring glory and honor to God, which allows him to send blessing into our lives. So that's the Christian way of life. It's not all this hustle for God that you see in Christian circles. So grace means God does all the work and we simply allow him to do it. And not only are we to live by grace, but we are to grow in grace. And that means growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And notice that God saved us before he called us, which dispels that false doctrine that we talked about, which is called limited atonement, where someone, some minister says that um, God 
chose us in eternity past. In other words, he chose the ones to save and he chose the ones not to save, which is just not true, absolutely false. And so this right here alone dispels that. So this means that we are chosen by God after salvation to serve him. And that service is based, once again, on his grace and not our human works. So you might ask, well, what, what do we do? What, how do we serve God if we don't do good works? Well, you should know the answer to that. The answer is when we do anything under the filling of the Holy Spirit, while we're in fellowship with God, then that is divine production. That is divine good. We're talking here about human good. And there is a vast difference because human good is done on the basis of the wrong motivation. If you're a Christian, because you should be motivated to do divine good works based on your relationship with God. And that should be the only motivation you need is your love for God to do good works. There's nothing wrong with good works as long as they're divine good works. And there is a difference, as I said. So. So this means we're chosen by God to serve him. And that service is based on his grace, not our good works. God designed a plan for every believer, and includes you and me, based strictly on his grace because of our union with Christ. The moment we were placed into union with Jesus Christ, remember that God did at least 40 things for us. And one of those things that he did for us is to give each one of us a spiritual gift. And we use that spiritual gift, whatever it may be, in order to serve the Lord. But the way that we do that is by allowing him to work through us and in us when we have doctrine in our soul and we apply that doctrine. So doing divine good works is application of accurate Bible doctrine. So God's predetermined plan of grace for mankind was designed in eternity past and revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. So in eternity past, God the Son agreed to come into the world as a human being and pay for man's, mankind's sin. So God also has a plan for every believer, which here Paul calls a holy calling, which is to follow the example of Jesus Christ as his representatives. Now, we studied here, I think this past week, about the, uh, about the doctrine of election, which is the doctrine of God selecting or choosing us for a particular service. And some of that service is common to every believer, like being an ambassador for Christ, for example. Every Christian is chosen by God after they believe, after they make a free will choice to believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. They are chosen to be God's representative here on this earth. That's what an ambassador is. Paul goes on to say, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Paul's just giving Timothy a reminder of who he is and the gift that he has and the responsibility as a pastor teacher that he has to teach this accurately because what was going on in the church's Ephesus is they were falling for this false doctrine of keeping the law for their spiritual lives. So Christ came to defeat Satan by his death on the cross, by his resurrection, by his ascension, and by his session where he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He came to provide eternal salvation. And when Christ accomplished that on the cross, he did so by defeating both spiritual and physical death. Remember that Christ died twice on the cross. So by his spiritual death, 
where he was separated from God for those three hours. The humanity of Christ was separated from deity for three hours on the cross as God the Father poured out the sins of the entire human race, past, present, and future, upon Jesus Christ and judged them there. And so when that occurred, he defeated spiritual death. He provided for every believer eternal life. That's what Paul calls life and immortality for those who believe in him. By his physical death and resurrection, he provided the victory over physical death for all believers. All believers receive an immortal, glorified body at the rapture of the church. So this is what Paul's talking about, that this has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's been told about in eternity past. It's been planned by God the Father in eternity past that Christ would come and accomplish all this and abolish death and bring life and immortality to light through the preaching of the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher, Paul says. God the Holy Spirit gave Paul the spiritual gifts of apostleship and pastor teacher and others. He had many spiritual gifts. The word for, for preacher in, in the Greek language means to announce a proclamation as a herald for a king, which fits perfectly because the pastor teacher is out heralding the message, proclaiming the message of the gospel and accurate doctrine for a king. And that king is Jesus Christ, the king of kings and Lord of lords. So that was what Paul was reminding Timothy. This is what happened when we laid hands on you, Timothy, and ordained you into the ministry as, the, as a pastor don't forget about that. Remember that. Rekindle that anew, afresh, so that you will not be hoodwinked by all this false doctrine that is inundating the churches throughout the region. And, and of course, that would include Ephesus. In verses 12 through, does anybody have any question up to this point? Let me stop a second or, or comment. Okay, so in verses 12 through 14, Paul says, For this reason, I also suffer these things. In other words, because I have stuck with the, the message of grace, because I have preached accurately the word of God, the mystery doctrine that was revealed to me by God uh, in the desert of Arabia, when shortly after he believed in Christ, he says, for this reason, I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he's able to protect what I have entrusted to him until that day. Hold on to the example, Paul tells Timothy, of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Protect through the Holy Spirit who indwells us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Every pastor teacher has been entrusted with the treasure. And of course, you know what that treasure is, sound, accurate, Bible doctrine. That is what they've been entrusted with. That is the treasure. There's no greater treasure in this life than God's word, because God's word reveals God. It reveals his essence and his character. It also reveals the plan of salvation, and it reveals the Christian way of life, our spiritual life that God wants you and I to be living while we're here on this earth. Paul was suffering at the hands of the Roman Empire through his imprisonment at the time he actually wrote the letter to Timothy. 
So he says, for this reason, and that means that Paul was in prison for preaching the gospel. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Paul had experienced great suffering, and at the same time, he had great happiness. How can that be? How can you suffer greatly and, and also at the same time have great happiness? It's all based on your relationship with God. If you have a relationship with God and you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you have accurate doctrine in your soul and you apply that doctrine, one of the applications of doctrine in suffering is to apply the happiness of God. Sharing the happiness of God is something that every believer can do if they have enough doctrine in their soul to realize that regardless of what circumstance they find themselves in, they can be happy. You know, they can take your freedom away from you like they did with Paul and imprison him. And for him, it was for preaching the gospel, but they can take that freedom away from you, but what they can't take away from you is the doctrine in your soul and the happiness that results from knowing that doctrine and applying that doctrine, and especially in times of suffering. That's really when we need to be really concentrating on the doctrine in our soul. So his circumstance of life did, did not dictate his happiness. Everything that Paul had suffered for the sake of Christ was nothing to him compared to what awaited him in eternity. He was not ashamed of Christ. Let me read Romans chapter 8 for you. If you want to go there, you can. But Romans chapter 8. I'll give you a glimpse here. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 and following, Paul wrote this to the, to the believers in the church at Rome, and he says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. What did Paul have? He had a personal sense of destiny. He was living his life as a believer in Christ in light of eternity, in light of what was coming in the future. Verse 19, he says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. What's Paul talking about? He's talking about when the millennium comes, and then after the millennium, all the way into eternity, where everything is going to be perfect. Remember what happens at the end of the millennium with regard to the creation? Does anybody remember? We get a new heavens and new earth. All of this is going to be renewed. Paul is saying up until this point, this creation is groaning. It's waiting to be renewed, and God's going to renew it. So the suffering that I'm going through now is nothing compared to the eternal state is what Paul is talking about here in Romans and also, of course, in 2 Timothy, writing to Timothy. For I know, Paul says, whom I have believed, and I am convinced, I am confident that he is able to protect what I have entrusted to him until that day. What has he entrusted to, to, uh, to God? 
He's trusted his very soul. He's trusted that God is going to keep his word and that Paul will have a glorified body and live for all eternity. So through his knowledge of Bible doctrine, Paul knew Jesus Christ very well and was confident that he was secure in Christ forever. This confidence in Christ was what carried Paul through the most difficult times in his life. He was always reminding himself of his relationship with Jesus Christ and all that that entailed and all that that meant for eternity. The word able here uh, means God is all-powerful, referring to his omnipotence. The Greek word for protect means to guard or to watch over. Our salvation is, remember, is guarded, protected, kept by the power of God. That's why we don't ever have to worry about losing our salvation. There's nothing you can do or anyone else can do to you, including Satan, that would cause you to lose your salvation. The reason is, is it doesn't depend on us. It depends upon God's power. And that's the greatest power there is. We are, we are guarded. We are protected by God's power. Our salvation cannot be lost. And he says, I'm convinced he's able to protect that, what I have entrusted to him. And that word entrusted means to make a deposit. The deposit of faith, quote unquote, that we made in Christ is our protection against spending eternity in the lake of fire and our confidence in spending eternity with our Savior. Paul's living his life and encouraging Timothy to do the same, to follow his example of living his life in light of eternity. Therefore, you have nothing to be ashamed of as a Christian. You can speak boldly as a Christian that you know who you've believed in. And you're convinced that he, the one you believe in, is able to guard, protect what you've entrusted to him, your salvation. You cannot ever lose it. You are secure in him. And Paul says, hold on to the example of sound words. What's that? That's doctrine. Sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Paul, as I just said, had received the mystery doctrine of the church age directly from God and his mission while he was here on this earth after becoming a believer to us to spread that mystery doctrine throughout the world. And he did a great job of it. He did this by preaching the gospel, by establishing churches, and then by teaching those churches accurate Bible doctrine, those sound words. It was now Timothy's responsibility to follow in the footsteps of Paul by continuing to teach accurate doctrine. Remember, Paul was coming to the end of his life. He was an old man at this time and knew he did not have much time left. The faith here, the faith, means that which is believed. What is that? That's Bible doctrine. So when he tells him to hold on to the example of sound words, which you have heard from me in the faith, he's talking about in doctrine, the doctrine you've learned from me, and love. And what kind of love is that? It's virtue love. It's impersonal love for all mankind, personal love for God, which you develop through the knowledge of doctrine and applied toward God, his word, and others. You love God. You love his word. If you do that, you'll love others. And you should also love yourself, by the way. So he says, I'm protected. Protect, he says, through the Holy Spirit who indwells us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Once again, entrusted means a deposit. First, Paul refers to the deposit of faith in the gospel, 
that gave him eternal life. Now, after salvation, there is to be another deposit of faith, which is in Bible, accurate Bible doctrine. How do we learn Bible doctrine? We apply our faith to it. We learn it, apply our faith to it. It becomes epinosis, full spiritual knowledge, not just academic knowledge. So now we have been protected by God, the Holy Spirit, who is our mentor. He's the one who teaches us. He's the one who helps us retain the information that we have. He is also the one who helps us to recall that information and apply it properly to our individual lives. So protecting the accurate Bible doctrine that we have deposited in our soul can be done only through the power of God, the Holy Spirit, who indwells each one of us. And if you doubt that, read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where it talks about the spirit bearing witness with our spirit and the natural man not being able to understand the things of God, but the Holy Spirit, he understands the things of God, and he's the one who teaches us that information. Let me just read them right quick since we're we're there and we got a little time. First Corinthians chapter two, beginning of verse 12, it says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit with a capital S who is from God so that we may know these things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, Paul says, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, capital S again, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. This is what Paul is telling Timothy. Hold on to those accurate words that you heard from my mouth, that accurate doctrine that I've given you, Timothy. Don't veer from that. Don't go astray. Don't be distracted. Keep teaching accurate doctrine. There's plenty of application for us uh, as well because God wants all believers to guard the doctrine that's in their soul, that accurate doctrine. He goes on to say in verses 15 through 18, you are aware of the fact that that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. So apparently here are some men here who Timothy knew about. Most likely they were in the church at Ephesus. That would be my uh, surmation, surmation, or that would be my opinion. Uh, but the, the word all, uh, that comes up here because it says everyone's abandoned me. You know, it's like Paul's uh, has an emotional moment and he says, you know, everybody's abandoned me. And not everyone had abandoned him, but all refers to a group of believer in the providence of Asia, which included Ephesus at that time, uh, who were, who once supported Paul uh, some commentators even say they may have been pastors of, of local churches that uh, they had supported Paul and they supported the gospel of grace. Perhaps they were in Ephesus where Timothy was the pastor since Paul said Timothy was aware of them and maybe they had gone out from the uh, ministry at Ephesus and gone on to other churches in that area. And so we don't know exactly. But the Roman providence of Asia in, in, at that time, in biblical times, included 
the ancient Greece, which is not the same as Greece today, but it also included modern day uh, Turkey. Ephesus is actually on the coast of modern day Turkey. So Phygelus and Hermogenes were two people who had supported Paul's ministry at one time. In other words, they had supported him and what he taught, right? So they were teachers, perhaps they were of grace. At least they were believers who at one time had believed in grace for salvation, but had fallen into a state of reversionism. Reversionism, of course, means to turn away from truth and to uh, and to and from those who, who preach it, like Paul. So Paul says they've turned away from me. We are not given details uh, as to why or how they turned away from Paul. We just know they did. But it's interesting that Paul mentions those to uh, Timothy, but. By contrast, he also mentions Onesphorus. Onesphorus was a true believer in grace, and he was a great supporter of Paul. I didn't put in everything there is about Onesphorus. He uh, was mentioned only a couple of times in the Bible, but here Paul says he, he and his family were a great blessing to him and supported his ministry, and which he acknowledged. And every time that Onephorus Onef Onef oh, <laughs> uh, had the opportunity, he would seek Paul out and visit Paul and be a, a, an encouragement to him. It was a great illustration of the ministry of refreshment, where Paul, you know, he was in prison and probably had a, a lot of loneliness himself. Even though he had a great relationship with God, he was still a human being and human companionship was important. So that's what this great believer in Christ uh, supplied for Paul. And uh, even some of the commentators said at, at this point that uh, this great man Onephorus had passed away and that's why Paul is referring to his family. But uh, we don't know that for a fact. But his family was still alive, apparently, in Ephesus. We know that for sure. And we know it from 2 Timothy 4, 19, where Paul mentions him, uh, his family again. So that's the book, first chapter of the book of 2 Timothy. Does anybody have any questions or comments about the lesson this evening. No one? Okay. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the great example that we have in these great men and women throughout the scriptures, but especially this evening about the great apostle Paul and this great believer on us for us. And of course, uh, Timothy, this young pastor who, who struggled at times, but always came back uh, in a magnificent way uh, as a pastor teacher. Help us to draw application from what Paul encouraged him to do. Help us to do the same, to stay strong in our faith, in our doctrine, in, our, uh, in, in the grace of, of God, and not be fooled or are deceived by those who would add works to salvation or add works in human effort to the Christian way of life. Just help us to be strong in our faith as Paul and Timothy and these other men were. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. See you next year. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thanks for the warning, Max. <laughs> You've been warned. I bet everybody appreciates you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see you Sunday. Later. All right. Later. Take care of yourself. I'll feel better. Thank you. You too. Right, take care of that back, boy. You guys take care of yourselves.
Patrick, you still there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. My That's screen cool. went all wonky on me, so. Oh, well. These electronics, I'll tell you, they're not easy. Yeah, I figured it out. It's just uh, when I go to mute myself and then it loses the picture.